Hello and welcome to Let's Play Crypt of the Sorcerer by Ian Livingstone. This is book number 26 in the Fighting Fantasy series. Here's the front cover. Okay, let's read the synopsis. Fighting fantasy books, over 10 million copies sold worldwide. An ancient evil is stirring. The long-dead sorcerer Razak has been reawoken and is poised to fulfil his dreams of death and tyranny. Now, the forces of chaos are at large across Alansia, and it seems that they are all pitted against you. For it is up to you to battle against the odds, to find the only weapon to which Razak is vulnerable, to arm yourself with protections against his awesome powers, and to face him in his lair, the Crypt of the Sorcerer. Part story, part game, this is a book in which you become the hero. Two dice, a pencil and an eraser are all you need. You decide which routes to take, which dangers to risk and which foes to fight. Cover illustration by Les Edwards. Okay, yeah, um, this is uh, this is written solely by Ian Livingstone, so it's really difficult, of course. Um, okay, next page. Puffin Books, Crypt of the Sorcerer. An ancient evil is stirring in the bowels of the earth, and the land is blighted. Now, the dread sorcerer Razak has been reawoken and is poised to fulfil his dreams of death and tyranny. He is vulnerable only to his long-lost sword, but he has an awesome range of powers. It will be an epic quest to find the sword, defeat the forces ranged against you, and face Razak himself. There are artefacts to find, without which failure is certain. And there are friends on the way, but above all, you will need to find your own courage and resourcefulness. Dare you travel the wastes and forests of Alansia, and ultimately to battle, um, and ultimately battle Razak in his lair? Two dice, a pencil, and an eraser are all you need to embark on this thrilling adventure, which is complete with its elaborate combat system and a score sheet on which to record your gains and losses. Many dangers lie ahead, and your success is by no means certain. You decide which routes to follow, which dangers to risk, and which uh, which dangers to risk, and which adversaries to fight. Ian Livingstone is the co-founder with Steve Jackson of Games Workshop, the hugely successful chain which specialises in fantasy games of all kinds. Colour map by Leo Hartas. Okay, there we go. E. Livingstone, Crypt of the Sorcerer. Okay, so, yeah, we did Beneath Nightmare Castle last time. Now we're doing Crypt of the Sorcerer. Then after that, it's going to be Star Strider and then Phantoms of Fear and so on and so forth. Um, illustrated by John Sibick, Puffin Books. Okay. To all Puffin warriors, especially Anne Ainley, Liz Attenborough, Susan Brent, Susan Elliott, Robin Waterfield and Annie Winter, Winterbottom or Winterbotham, <laughs> Winterbottom, um, Botham. Yeah, um, Robin Waterfield is the author of some other books, isn't he? I don't recognise the other names though. Okay, okay. So I'll put some time stamps, whatever you want to call it, in the video description if you want to skip to the background and and or skip to the first paragraph. Um, regardless, here we go. Introduction. Before embarking on your adventure, you must first determine your own strengths and weaknesses. Use dice to determine your initial scores. On pages 16 to 17, there is an adventure sheet on which you may use, uh, which you may use to record the details of, of an adventure. On it, you will find boxes for recording your skill, stamina, and luck scores. You are advised either to record your scores on the adventure sheet in pencil or make photocopies of the sheet uh, to use in future adventures. Skill, stamina and luck. Roll one die. Let's roll one die. Need one. Yes. There we go. No. No. Yes. Okay, so we get a six. So that was the... Uh, yeah, roll one die, add six to this number, and enter this total in the skill box on the adventure sheet. So that's our skill. So that is 12 in total. That was lucky, wasn't it? Okay. Roll both dice, add 12 to the number rolled, and enter this total in the stamina box. Yeah, it's very important that we have good uh, statistics for this book. It's very difficult. So, yep, yeah, that'll do. 11. 11 plus 12 is 23, so... 23 for the stamina. Uh, 
Uh, there is also a luck box, roll one die, add six to this number and enter this total in the luck box. Right. Um, yes. Yep, that'll do first time quite good. So that gives us 12 luck, good. Alright, um, for reasons that will be explained below, skill, stamina and luck scores change constantly during an adventure. You must keep an accurate record of these scores and for this reason you are advised either to write small in the boxes or to keep an eraser handy, but never rub out your initial scores. Although you may be awarded additional skill, stamina and luck points, these totals may never exceed your initial scores except on very rare occasions when, you're, when you will be instructed on a particular page. Your skill score reflects your swordsmanship and general fighting expertise, the higher the better. Your stamina score reflects your general constitution, your will to survive, your determination and overall fitness. The higher your stamina score, the longer you will be able to survive. Your luck score indicates how naturally lucky a person you are. Luck and magic are facts of life in the fantasy kingdom you are about to explore. Battles, you will often come across pages in the book which instruct you to fight a creature of some sort. An option to flee may be given, but if not, or if you choose to attack the creature anyway, you must resolve the battles as described below. First, record the creature's skill and stamina scores in the first vacant monster encounter box on your adventure sheet. The scores for each creature are given in the book each time you have an encounter. The sequence of combat is then 1. Roll both dice once for the creature. Add its skill score. This total is the creature's attack strength. Roll both dice. No, two. Roll both dice once for yourself. Add the number rolled to your current skill score. This total is your attack strength. If your attack strength is higher than that of the creature you have wounded it, proceed to step four. If the creature's attack strength is higher than yours, it has wounded you. Proceed to step five. If both attack strength details are the same, attack strength totals are the same sorry you have avoided each other's blows start the next attack round from step one above step four you have wounded the creature so subtract two points from its stamina score you may use your luck here to do additional damage see over step five the creature has wounded you so subtract two points from your own stamina score again you may use luck at this stage see over excuse me Step 6. Make the appropriate adjustments to either the creature's or your own stamina scores and your luck, and your luck score if you use luck. See over. Step 7. Begin the next attack round by returning to your current skill score and repeating steps 1 to 6. This sequence continues until the stamina score of either you or the creature you are fighting has been reduced to zero. Death. Fighting more than one creature. If you come across more than one creature in a particular encounter, the instructions on that page will tell you how to handle the battle. Sometimes you will treat them as a single monster, sometimes you will fight each one in turn. Luck. At various times during your adventure, either in battle, battles or when you come across situations in which you could either be lucky or unlucky, details of these are given on the pages themselves. You may call on your luck to make the outcome more favourable, but beware, using luck is a risky business, and if you are unlucky, the results could be disastrous. The procedure for using your luck is as follows. Roll two dice. If the number rolled is equal to or less than your current luck score, you have been lucky, and the result will go in your favour. If the number rolled is higher than your than your current luck score, you have been unlucky, and you, and you will be penalised. This procedure is known as testing your luck. Each time you test your luck, you must deduct you must subtract one point from your current luck score. Thus, you will soon realise that the more you rely on your luck, the more risky this will become. Using luck in battles. On certain pages of the book, you'll be told to test your luck and will be told the consequences of your being lucky or unlucky. However, in battles, you, have always, you always have the option of using your luck either to inflict a more serious wound on a creature you have just wounded or to minimise the effects of a wound the creature has just inflicted on you. If you have just wounded the creature, you may test your luck as, as described above. If you are lucky, you have inflicted a severe wound and may subtract an extra two points from the creature's stamina score. However, if you are unlucky, the wound was a mere graze and you must restore one point to the creature's stamina, i.e. instead of scoring the normal two points of damage, you have now scored only one. If the creature has just wounded you, you may test your luck to try to minimise the wound. If you, are, if you are lucky, you have managed to avoid the full damage of the blow, restore one point of stamina, i.e. instead of doing two points of damage, it has done only one. If you are unlucky, you have taken a more serious blow, subtract one extra stamina point. Remember that you must subtract a point, you must subtract, what does that say? Unknown, um, it's either A or one. Um, uh, remember that you must subtract a point from your own luck score each time you test your luck. 
Restoring skill, stamina and luck. Skill, your skill score will not change much during your adventure. Occasionally a page may give instructions to increase or decrease your skill score. A magic weapon may increase your skill, but remember that only one weapon can be used at a time. You cannot claim two skill bonuses for carrying two magic swords. Um, your skill score can never exceed its initial value unless specifically instructed stamina. Your stamina score will change a lot during your adventure as you fight monsters and undertake arduous tasks. As you near your goal, your stamina may your stamina level may be dangerously low and battles may be particularly risky, so be careful. Unlike other fighting fantasy game books, you do not start your adventure with provisions. Okay, I'll just note that. So we have naught provisions. There we go. However, during the course of the adventure, there will be opportunities for you to regain stamina points in various ways. Remember also that your stamina score may never exceed its initial value unless specifically instructed on a page. Luck. Additions to your luck score are awarded through the adventure when you have been particularly lucky. Details are given on the pages of the book. Remember that, as with skill and stamina, your luck score may never exceed its initial value unless specifically instructed on a page. Okay, here's the adventure sheet, which I'm pleased to see has not been written in, even though it's just a PDF of the book, but still it's nice to see. Anyway, here's the background. So if you, if you press the timestamp in the video description, this will take you right here. Anyway, um, background. Chalice is a small town lying on the banks of Silver River at the base of Moonstone Hills. It has grown from being merely a cluster of cabins and huts to its present size, ma mainly because it became an important trading centre for prospectors seeking gold in the hills. It was the first safe haven for merchants who had travelled west from the flatlands on their way to Silverton. In Chalice, they could rest and do business without fear of attack. There were plenty of inns and places of entertainment and it used to be among the most boisterous towns of Alansia. But now as you look out of the window of your upstairs bedroom at the Lion Inn there is no sign of merriment. For three weeks the sky has been dark and menacing. People recently arriving in Chalice from the east have told of pestilence, plague, disease and famine moving ever closer to the west. Only yesterday a story spread like wildfire through the town that someone had discovered where the source of evil lay. An elf flying south on his giant eagle over the southern edge of Moonstone Hills noticed a deep fissure in the ground out of which rose a putrid smelling vapour. All around the fissure the grass was blackened and the trees were stunted and leafless. As he flew over the fissure, the elf said, he saw a scorched and withered hand rise out of the gap its claw-like index finger pointing up at the eagle. An energy, an energy bolt shot up from the tip of the finger and burned a hole straight through the poor creature. It crashed to the ground, but the elf escaped with his life and walked to Chalice to tell his tale. Um, you are a friend of the old wizard Yaz Stromo, who lives on the southern edge of Darkwood Forest, and you decide to visit him and relate the elf's tale. In the now familiar dusky light of day, you spur your horse northwards to Yastromo's tower, and before nightfall you reach the overgrown path that leads to it. You dismount quickly, stride up to the huge oak door and ring the brass bell that hangs in the stone archway. There is no reply, but suddenly you are tapped on the shoulder and you whirl around, reaching for your sword. There will be no need for that, grunts the old man who stands before you, shaking his finger in admonishment. What are you doing here, anyway, disturbing my peace and quiet? I haven't laid eyes on you for over a year, and now you just turn up unannounced, walk straight through my herb garden and ring my bell long enough to wake the dead. Well, what do you want? Uh, you smile to yourself while you watch the grumpy old wizard displaying his usual hospitality. And what's so funny, he asks. Your expression immediately changes, and the Astromo frowns when he sees the concerned look on your face. I think we should go upstairs so that you can tell me what is troubling you. I presume something is troubling you, as I'm sure you wouldn't visit me for any other reason, and I can guess that it has something to do with this infernal dark sky. When you have finished telling Yastromo the elf's tale, he remains sitting silently in his old oak chair, his face as sombre as a grave. At last he speaks, sighing with every word. Then my worst fears are realised, the necromancer has risen. Those fools, their greed might now bring an end to life in Alansia. 
unless. Completely puzzled by Estromo's mutterings, you ask him to explain. As if describing a horrible nightmare, Yastromo recounts the legend of the evil necromancer Razak, who threatened Alanzia 100 years ago. Although he first learned his skills as an apprentice to a lawful wizard, Razak was attracted early on in life by the dark power of evil. He, reali he realised that he could become a great sorcerer who would one day be able to command everyone to obey him. He had no desire or intention to use his magic to help Alanzia. He wanted the kingdom to be brought to its knees. He travelled to, to a remote part of eastern Alanzia and there he practised his arcane acts. He quickly progressed through the levels of dark magic from lowly apprentice to wizard and then sorcerer so that at last his powers were so great that he became a necromancer having spent the last 40 years in solitude. Razak then sent messages to all the nobles of Alanzia, demanding that they acknowledge him as their ruler. At first they ignored him, for none had heard of him. Razak took umbrage, and in retaliation brought plague and pestilence to the nobles' provinces, giving them until the next full moon to recognise his leadership. Many warriors offered to try to slay Razak, and many died in the attempt, but one brave man by the name of Cole succeeded and saved Alanzia. He owned a sword which he had found in the Moonstone Hills, gripped by a skeletal hand rising from a mist-covered lake, across which he was sailing a raft. Cole was mesmerised by the sword's magnificent beauty. He immediately wanted it for his own and reached out for it. The skeleton made no attempt to prevent him and simply slipped down into the muddy depths of the lake as soon as it realised the sword no, as soon as it released the sword, sorry. Cole was so overwhelmed with the sword that nothing else mattered to him. He steered his raft to the shore and began testing his new weapon. He discovered that nothing could dull its edge and that he could cut through plate mail armour with ease. He did not realise that the sword had once belonged to Razak and was the only weapon in the whole world with the power to slay him. Razak, in order to become a necromancer, had had to relinquish all weapons, but there was no power strong enough to destroy his cursed sword. To try to rid himself of the sword, Razak threw it into the lake, but it rose to the surface in the grip of the skeleton. For years the skeleton clutched the sword until Cole caught sight of it and took it for himself. And so a twist of fate took the invincible Cole to Razak, and Razak was slain at the hand of Cole by the sword that had once been his own. But the moment Razak was slain, Cole's flesh fell from his bones and lay in a pile of dust around his skeletal feet. Razak's magic had condemned him to an eternal nightmare as a skeleton, unable to release the sword. He seized a hooded robe and fled into Moonstone Hills, and it is said that to this day he drifts constantly across the same lake on his raft, clutching the sword, unable to rest until someone takes it from him. Razak's body was placed in a stone sarcophagus and entombed in the fissure in the southern hills. Now the crypt was sealed by a lawful sorcerer who decreed that it must remain unopened for 110 years, otherwise the necromancer would rise with a host of undead to destroy all life. I can only assume, concludes Yastroma with a deep sigh, that treasure hunters found the necromancer's crypt and opened it unknowingly. Razak must be destroyed before it is too late. Oh, but it's going to be so difficult. We'll need to find Razak's sword and a number of talismans and amulets that will protect you from the necromancer's magic. I trust you will, vol I trust you will volunteer for this mighty task? Slowly you nod your head, although your brain is still spinning with Yastromo's tale of Razak and poor Cole. Good, continues Yastromo. Now, don't worry about the sword. I won't let you become a skeleton. Just bring it back here, and in the meantime, I'll be calling on a few people who can help us. There is no time to waste. You must find the lake in Moonstone Hills. Rest well tonight and leave at first light. What little of it there is. Uh, now turn over. Okay, here's paragraph one. Okay, off we go, finally. Anyway, so I'll put a timestamp in the video de in the video description for this um, first paragraph. You are woken from a nightmare in which undead creatures attack you with swords. By Yastromo tapping you on the shoulder. I'll start again. Um, you are woken from a nightmare in which undead creatures attack you with swords. By Yastromo tapping you on the shoulder. Time to get up. It's almost dawn, he says in a sleepy voice. Within 20 minutes you are outside and mounted on your horse. Yastromo smiles ever optimistic in the face of danger, and hands you a small glass file. 
Healing potion, he explains. Enough for five tots. Note this on your adventure sheet. The healing potion will restore four stamina points each time it is drunk. Make a note each time you drink a tot. Okay. So, equipment. Um, healing potion. Five tots. Tot TV. Do you remember that? Or well, Tots TV, I can't remember. It was whatever it was, it was rubbish. Anyway, um uh, and uh restores four stamina points whoops for each tot. Tilly, Tom and Tiny, not their names. Anyway, enough of that. Um now, the old wizard then waves to you as you gallop off, heading east towards Moonstone Hills in search of the Lost Lake. By midday, the hills rise up threateningly from the horizon, flanking you from north to south, and you wonder how you will ever find the lake. By nightfall, you find yourself at the foot of the hills, where Silver River f flows out onto the Windward Plain towards Chalice. You decide to camp by the river and make a fire uh, to keep you warm. Uh, to keep yourself warm. That's, that, that should be yourself then. Anyway, um, and also to ward off any hunters of the night. The night passes without incident, and in the morning you wake feeling hungry. After eating bread and cheese from your backpack, I thought we didn't have any provisions, um, you climb onto your horse and decide which way to head. If you wish to wade across the river and ride east into the hills, turn to 255. If you would rather follow the river north up into the hills, turn to 146. Okay, we're going to follow the river north up into the hills and turn to 146. You climb steadily up into the hills following the winding river. After an hour or so, the ground becomes very marshy and your horse has to struggle to keep moving forward. It appears that this part of the river often breaks its banks and floods the valley. If you wish to keep heading north, turn to 249. If you'd rather cross the river and ride east into the hills, turn to 53. Okay, we're going to keep heading north and turn to 249. Ahead, you see movement in the tall, wet grass and become aware of a loud buzzing noise. Six large, mottled, black harpoon flies suddenly rise into the air, each the size of a pigeon. Although their heads appear to have an elongated proboscis, it is actually a poisoned, needle-like spike which harpoon flies can shoot at a target. They can only grow one needle at a time, and it takes a week for the needle to grow back after it has been fired. The poison paralyzes the harpoon fly's victims, and female harpoon flies then lay their eggs under the skin so that the maggots will have plenty of meat to feed on when they hatch. Roll one die to determine how many needles hit you. If you are hit by one or two needles, turn to 346. If you are hit by three or four needles, turn to 388. If you are hit by five or six needles, turn to 13. And, and, and there are the harpoon flies. Okay, um... Yeah, this is a nasty start, because if you do actually roll five or six, then we're dead. So I'll have to roll again if that happens, because I'm not starting the book again. Okay, we've got a four. That's not too bad. Um, three or four needles, ten to 388. This is Ian Livingstone, after all, don't forget. Now, the strong poison acts quickly, and you feel your limbs begin to stiffen. Lose... St Lose six stamina points and two skill points. Uh, that puts me down to ten skill and seventeen stamina points. Um, with extreme effort, you manage to keep your horse moving and escape the grotesque harpoon flies. As soon as they are left behind, you swallow a lot of Yastromo's healing potion. Um, to counter the effects of the poison. You immediately feel better, but you do not regain any skill or stamina points. Oh, swallow a tot, sorry. So I've swallowed a tot. So that puts me down to four tots. And so I'll just say one used. There we go. Lots of parentheses, new line. There we go. Um... 
You swallow a tot of Yazdromo's healing potion to counter the effect of the poison. You immediately feel better, but you do not regain any skill or stamina points. Feeling, re feeling relieved to be over the marsh, you continue your trek into the hills. Follow the river. Following the river. Turn to 185. You wend your way slowly. You know, something that annoys me. I keep hearing people say, should have went. No, it's should have gone. I mean, it's I went and I have gone. Why do people say I, I, sh I should have went? It doesn't make any sense. Unless they're talking about um, uh, the verb wend like this. But the past tense of this verb is wended, not went. Although went does come from wend. Um... But went is the past sense of go, not the past participle. Anyway, um, you wend your way slowly north and two hours later notice a cave halfway up the hill on the other side of the valley. If you wish to cross the river to look at the cave, turn to 97. If you would rather continue, fo continue following the river, turn to 159. Okay, we're going to cross the river to, uh, uh, to look at the cave and turn to 97. The river is wide but not very deep and you have no trouble in crossing it. You ride up the hill and as you approach the cave you see that a well-worn path runs out from its mouth and down the hill. You climb down from the saddle, tie your horse to a rock and walk up to the entrance. The cave is dark and you cannot see far beyond the entrance. If you wish to enter the cave, turn to 310. If you would rather ride back down the hill and follow the river up the valley, turn to 284. Okay, we're going, um, we're going to enter the cave and turn to 310. Okay, it is pitch dark inside the cave and to safeguard yourself from, fo from falling down an unseen pit, you tap the ground in front of you with your sword. Suddenly, your sword hits something solid directly in your path, which sounds as if it is a metal object. You reach out and feel the object and deduce that it is a large metal box bolted to the ground. It has a hinged lid. If you wish to try lifting the lid, turn to 45. If you would rather walk back to your horse, turn to 235. Okay, we're going to try and lift the lid and turn to 45. You stand... Sorry, excuse me a moment. There we go. Um, you stand to one side of the metal box, fearing a trap, and lift up the lid with your sword. The cave is immediately bathed in brilliant white light, which shines out from the box and is so intensely bright that it hurts your eyes. Squinting through half-closed eyes, you see that you are not alone. Animated by the light, two... Rad hulks lumber towards you from the back of the cave. They are hairless and have sallow skin which bulges with pulsating red veins running up and down their bodies. Although blind, they can sense your body heat and move in to touch you. Will you try to close the lid of the box? Turn to 372. Turn and run? Turn to 395. Or fight the rad hulks? Turn to 143. And there are the rad hulks. Okay, um, we are going to fight the Rad Hulks and turn to 143. Uh, the mindless Rad Hulks shuffle towards you and do not flinch from the blow of your sword. They are charged by the light and are powerful opponents. Look at that already. Skill 10, Stamina 5. Skill 10, Stamina 6. Um, first Rad Hulk, Skill 10, Stamina 5. Second Rad Hulk, Skill 10, Stamina 6. Fight them one at a time. If you win, turn to 87. Okay, we will fight the Rad Hulks in the next video, but I'll just put them down here. What are they called? First and second, 10, 5, 10, 6. Skill 10, Stamina 5, and then a second, nope, nope, and 
Here we go. Skill 10, stamina 6. Okay, and we will fight these critters in the next video. So thanks very much for watching. I'll just note down that I'm on paragraph 143. 143, there we go. And uh, yeah, hope you can join me. Hope you can join me for the next video. Um, yeah, okay. Um, thanks a lot and goodbye.